Welcome to One Broken Mom, a podcast dedicated to raising awareness of mental health, parenting, and self-improvement. I am the host, Ami Quiricone. One Broken Mom is not a family show. It is meant for adults and contains sometimes adult language. The topics I cover can be serious and unsettling to people. However, I do have a sense of humor laced with a little bit of a punk rock attitude. So if you're interested in real talks about real stuff by real people so that we can all get better together, well, then you're in the right place. And so welcome. All right. Now, some of you may recall my episode with Susie D. Young of Trauma-Informed Parent. Remember that she works for an organization called the Aviel Foundation, which we did touch on a little bit in that interview with her. It was after that interview that I had a ton of questions about the specific research that the foundation has been supporting. And so since that was kind of out of Susie's realm of expertise, she hooked me up with today's guest on One Broken Mom, and it's Nick Hoffman, who is the Director of Development for the Aviel Foundation. So welcome, Nick, to the show. Thank you for the invite. I really appreciate it. Awesome. So because people tend to jump around while they're listening to the podcast episodes, I'm wondering if you can help by, let's go back to the beginning here and let's, let's start with introducing the Aviel Foundation to the listeners right. and to the viewers. I mean, who, who is this group and what is this group? Yep. And then just one, of my title has changed. So we have okay. website, but it's just <laughs> imagination officer. So I don't know if we want to redo that or not, or. No, we'll uh, just go, we'll roll with it. I'll update it on the podcast notes. We're good. <laughs> um, yeah, so the, the Aviel Foundation uh, exists because unfortunately we're a legacy foundation of the Sandy Hook murder. Aviel was one of the 21st graders and six educators uh, killed on that, that cold December day. Um, and uniquely, uh, Jeremy, H Jeremy Richman and Jennifer Hensel, Aviel's parents, um, were the only parents to leave what I call orphan parents that day in the firehouse after they were notified of the death of the children and, and family members. Um, so it, it put them in a, in a, a tailspin um, and they leaned into what they know. Both of them are scientists, um, or were scientists. Uh, Dr. Richmond's expertise was in neuroscience. He was a, a pharmaceutical um, researcher at the time who worked for Bowen and Engelheim. Um, Jennifer uh, is a medical writer currently, uh, spends a lot of time with epidemiology and cancer research. Um, so literally over the course of 72 hours, as his friends and family are descending on their home to share their grief, um, they, they coalesced and, and crafted our mission. So December 14th was the day of the murders by December 17th. You know, handwritten pen is what they devised our mission to be. And our mission is to prevent violence and build compassion through neuroscience research, community engagement, and education. Um, and the origin of that was looking at violence as a behavior that happens within our brain um, and our brain is a biological organ, organ just like our, our liver kidney lungs um, and similarly if we're seeing uh, issues come from those organs we can look at them scientifically and come up with interventions cures and treatment um, so we wanted to take a hard pivot away from um, what's the typical response to mass shootings there, there's, there's a lot of groups doing tremendous work and gun violence prevention, um, uh, you know, different fields in terms of political advocacy, um, and it was it was a large field uh, to even get a stable footing in. But because of the uniqueness of Dr. Richmond and Jennifer's background, um, it, it allowed a, a very unique mission. So the way we deliver that mission is we fund innovative neuroscience research and public health research that looks at violence as a public health epidemic or as a disease. And we give it basically essentially like startup funding. Um, we look at ourselves as a disruptor in the field. Um, there's a lot of um, uh, political hurdles at play in terms of funding violence uh, research. Um, and our goal is to get some money behind these innovative theses um, to where it's scientific data that, that's irrefutable. Um, and then larger groups like the CDC or the NIH or you know, bigger foundations with far more wealth than we have can push this further, even farther. Um, and then on the flip side, we also recognize that science in a vacuum doesn't serve everybody. You know, so these conversations I'm having with you are as important as the research we're doing in labs across the country. Um, so we developed a couple programs. Susie, who you had on uh, a couple weeks ago, she is also the curator of our brainstorm experience, which is a, a live experience. Um, that brings in brain health experts, everything from 
uh, Jane Polly's visit, visit us, Brene Brown, Andrew Solomon, uh, talking about their experiences um, with brain health issues themselves or as advocates or uh, researchers. And what this allows us to do is help to end the stigma that's aligned with mental health. Let's have public forums and talk about the things that we all suffer with. And we're, we're trained and, and uh, uh, programmed to not recognize our, our brain illnesses or brain injuries or, or brain vulnerabilities. Um, and we really want to move beyond that. And recognizing that if we just fund neuroscience and it stays in labs at universities across the world and doesn't get to the everyday people, we will have no impact. Um, so we need to make sure we're, we're perpetually educating and empowering folks to embrace brain health. Um, and through that, it, it builds compassion. And the more compassion there is, there's less violence. Um, so a lot of it is really prophylactic as well in terms of the way we implement the mission. Yeah. And I, you know, I, because I think it's really hard, especially with the Sandy Hook tragedy to, and I had mentioned this when I was speaking with, with Susie, um, for a lot of people to feel compassion for a person who grabs a gun and murders 26 mm -hmm. people, you know, I mean, that just, I mean, you know, um, it's a natural right. reaction to have nothing but visceral hate, you know, for an anger at something like that. So mm -hmm. I can imagine, you know, as you say, a disruptor, that makes me smile because, you know, I love disruptors. Um, but right. the idea of saying that, you know, identifying violence and finding roots to it that, um, that make it easy for us to start to understand how important it is, is that it can occur, um, that it's, that it's not, you know, necessarily. And when we talk about the research, which is why I really want to, you know, talk about this is, um, is that there are there are origins to it it's not just a it's not always just this weird little defect that some people are born with and some people are that there are contra you know contributing factors that come from those experiences you know that can tip children you know and i even in the grief that i felt as a mother you know at that time it was several years ago you know i, I remember that day pulling a picture up of my two kids at the age you know, of the victims and feeling just this, I mean, this whole body sickness through me of like, I could, you know, I couldn't even imagine the pain that all those parents, you know, were experiencing there in Newtown. I mean, it just as a, you know, I grieved with them in a, in a, in a different way, but yet still also felt grief for a shooter, you know, because when we look at histories of, you know, violent behaviors and stuff, it's, it's really hard not to see the trauma history, you know, that, that kind of follows them along and stuff. And so, um, like I said, as a disruptor, it's probably, um, I can imagine, um, pretty polarizing for people that don't want to see a, and take a compassionate view of violence. They want to view it as this isolated thing and that, um, you know, that those people are, you know, evil born that way and will, you know, good riddance that they don't deserve that. And so, um, it, you know, have you ran into and encountered, I, I, yeah, this wasn't one of my questions, but I'm kind of going with this, but have you encountered people that are upset or um, somehow uh, offended by this approach to understanding the origins of violent behavior in order to build compassion for a view of that? I, mean, I, I, I think it, it takes some explanation. You know, I mean, we're, we're unique in the field. We can't find anybody else who's, who's funding neuroscience research strictly to prevent violence and build compassion. Um, and and you, when we say compassion, you know, it's, it's, it's a broad skill, um, and it's not specific to um, the, the individual who implemented Avi's death as well. I mean, mm -hmm. it's recognizing there were, there were missteps throughout the life of, of all mass shooters, um, that if, if communities had the right tools and stepped in, we can prevent things well, well in advance. Mm -hmm. uh, so it is, it's, you know, even just our, our adherence to brain health over mental health. We feel like mental health has run its course. You know, we, we live in a new town of the town that used to house a insane asylum, um, and I was here for 80-something years, and, and, you know, there's there's terms throughout uh, psychiatric history, imbecile, moron, that were at one time clinical that now aren't even appropriate to use in everyday vernacular. Um, and it, we feel the same way with, with mental. It's, it's becoming so, it has become so stigmatized, and you can just say that person's mental, and it's a pejorative, uh, you know, so... If we can just, just get people to recognize the brain, um, you know, as an organ. Uh, I was having a conversation yesterday about with somebody about violent media. Um, and every media, regardless of its intent, we consume through the filter, which we consume the rest of our life, which is our brain. And when you take something in and filter it through it, it's going to have an impact on that. Uh, so whether it's, it's compassionate media, whether it's funny media, whether it's, it's heartwarming media, we feel an emotional connection to it. Um, 
So I always find it, it funny when people, you know, say, well, it's not just, you know, violent video games or movies. It's not, it's not but it's, it's a component of it. Um, and anything that we do that allows a human being to see another human being um, as a threat and as something that is less than human, um, it, it doesn't make our society safe. Um, and that doesn't mean that uh, we need to eliminate uh, violent video games. Um, I'm a parent myself. Uh, I think there's there's appropriate ages if you're comfortable that as a parent to expose your kids to it. Um, there's incredibly inappropriate ages to expose your kids to it as well. Um, and it's it's looking at us societally and, and how are we um, being impacted by the volume of media we're consuming. You know, I mean, one of my favorite pieces of media is podcast. I listen to them all day because it brings back the lost art of conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not emoji texts, and it, you know, it's, it's you, you understand the nuance of words, and people can uh, really work through thoughts and, and share those thoughts. Um, and they're uh, they're it's done in an environment that is looking for challenging conversations, and, and we have too little of those. Like we. we we defer to our bias, and once we hear something that we feel we can pigeonhole somebody, oh, they're this or that, and they're not part of me, like I, I no longer need to listen to that. Um, I feel we're at a societal breaking point for that. And if we understand bias and we understand um, in group, out group dynamics, that's really the origin for a lot of mass violence. Um, you look at the, the genocide in Rwanda, you look at the, the Nazi regime, it was all about dehumanizing a whole section of people. Um, for the benefit of, of your end group. Uh, you know, so our work you know, isn't just um, looking at mass shootings. Uh, it isn't just looking at gun violence. It's looking at all violence. I like to say big B violence, violence to self, violence to others, um, even through maladaptive coping mechanisms, uh, you know, drug addiction, alcohol abuse, um, uh, overeating. I mean, that there's so many things that our brain misinterprets that makes it really difficult for our bodies to adjust to and, and navigate life in a successful way. So mm -hmm. that's why we feel it's so important to really just start collecting as much data as possible on, on neuroscientific research. And you know, we feel we're still in the baby steps phase. Um, and that's why it's, it's kind of a, an exciting place to be with our research side, because we see so much brilliant research come in. Um, and, and really our, our only Holdback is our, our the lack of financial resources we have to put out. You know, we're, we're behind the research. Right, um, right. So let's let's jump into some of that research because um, the website that you guys have, which is avialfoundation.org, and the link will be in the podcast notes for people that want to link in and read about it. Um, you had you, you guys provide grants, and the ones that um, some of the case studies that I saw on there are to. Um, other researchers at different universities and, yep. um, and and that's where the exciting stuff is and so I'd love to um, because that's why I started asking Susie like well what did you find and she's like whoa 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 you need to talk to somebody else like <laughs> that can give you that so that's why you're on here so um, let's talk about you know one of them that I noticed is Dr. Terry Moffitt and she's mm -hmm. one of the directors on your scientific advisory board for the Avial Foundation but she's also a researcher and writer like a prolific studier of antisocial and violent behaviors at Duke University and so one of the projects that you guys have funded has been, she's been involved in it. So do you want to kind of walk us through that and what are some of the, because I read it, I'm just going to jump in here. I read it and um, it's, uh, it's startling. I mean, you know, it's, it, there's shocking elements to it, which I want people to, to hear because you do have to kind of like absorb it because we do need to pivot, you know, in thinking. And so now I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about, you know, that particular yeah. So Temi's brilliant, um, and we have, we have three different um, grants we fund, and so uh, Temi is um, a, a unique one. Um, she and uh, uh, Dr. Nadine Burke-Harris, who was actually just named in February to be the uh, first Surgeon General of California, are the only two awarded our Luminary Award, and that's just us completely infatuated with their effectiveness in terms of moving our mission forward and saying, Here's $25,000, keep doing the amazing work, um, and, and let's support each other in any way possible. Um, so one of the, the most incredible things Temi oversees is a longitudinal study that's based out of uh, New Zealand. So it's a cohort of, not exactly sure of all the numbers, but over a thousand people that they've been following from birth, and I think they're into the mid-30s now. Mm -hmm. um, 
and one of the, the things that they've been tracking was, uh, well, they've been tracking literally everything uh, about uh, these folks since the day they were born. Um, but one of the components they were tracking was the, the draw of social need by this cohort of people. Um, so she took the, the Pareto principle, the 80-20 principle, that you can apply to any organization you belong to, any workforce you belong to, it's, it's you know, typically 20% of X is doing, you know, 80% of the work and vice versa. Um, but what they found was 20% of that cohort was consuming 80% of the social draw. So the, the welfare money, the, the incarceration fund, the, um, you know, the equivalent to the Medicaid, Medicare, um, jobless hours, cigarette smokes, you know, all these, these maladaptive coping mechanisms and so they had all the data about the trajectory of their life, so they're able to go back and start looking at when did these things go awry? Like when did we start seeing markers that these folks would have ended up in this, this 20%? Um, and amazingly, it was early as three years old. And they were able to find that things were either happening uh, genetically within them, environmentally around them, that gave, uh, indications that this was the trajectory of these folks would be heading on. Uh, so, and this is where, you know, she gets in a, in, in a little bit of trouble, but she's a scientist you study and you, and you apply it. People are like, well, three years old, what are we supposed to do? Like, do we, we don't want to get into, uh, what's that Tom Cruise movie or uh, that minority report, you know, where we're, 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 we're prejudging people and, and putting them into jail because, you know, genetically you're a mess. It's not what we're trying to accomplish. What we prefer, or what should be done, is when we recognize this, let's, let's wrap those folks in protective factors. Let's give them the mental health care they need, or the brain health care they need, the, the physical health care they need. Let's, let's coach their parents up in what it means to be a parent. Uh, I've spent a lot of time in my career primarily working for a behavioral health institution in, in a town, most of the new town, uh, that, that focused on kids from prenatal to 18 years old. And the biggest component was particularly in generational uh, uh, suffering, is the lack of parenting skills that parents have. You know, we, we assume everybody, you know, just has it. And, and it's literally the toughest job in the world. Um, and if you weren't, if you didn't have positive skills modeled for you, you're not going to be able to deploy those skills. Um, and so it's really looking at how do we empower people who we see are at risk uh, to help mitigate these things well in advance. Um, you know, and you just look at the, this economically and politically, it just it just makes so much more sense if we have uh, strong societies where everybody has an opportunity. Um, and even if some of those uh, components of risk still manifest because they're developmental delays or, you know, genetic issues, um, we're still in a better spot because they're in a loving, nurturing environment and they have the support systems and they can trust other human beings and they can be their own protective factor. Um, and that's really what was so compelling about Tammy's study. Um, and she's done a lot of great work as well with like marijuana users. Like one of the, the articles um, she wrote recently was about the impact on marijuana usage in the developmental brain, like 12 to 22. Um, and it's, it's a, a, a psychoreactive drug. And it's, it's why people enjoy it, why it relaxes people. Um, but recognizing, you know, particularly in boys, like the, the, the male brain doesn't come to full uh, stop basically until 26, 27 years old, and then it's still plastic, so it can grow after that. But when you stick stuff like that within your, your uh, most important organ, it, it inhibits your intellectual growth. And, and that isn't what anything, we don't want anybody to be. Um, Intentionally harming their ability to think and navigate and you know, perform cognitive tasks. Um, and she got a lot of flack for that. A lot of people referred back to her child forecasting thing. And, and it just it plays into the biases we all possess, where we can't just look at things, consume them, and not react to them and say, yeah, that actually does make sense. Like, nobody's really going to advocate for a 12 year old to be smoking marijuana, like, you know, ideally. But it just, it just you, you create such a further that people, you know, take offense at, at what are groundbreaking studies. Like, let's, let's have the information before we make these big decisive decisions. Right. Uh, and that's, it's just incredible work that she's doing. And then I'll, I'll reference Nadine Burke-Harris as well, um, because she's doing um, 
similarly incredible work. And now the influence he's going to have in California, the state, and ideally the nation, is just going to be transformative. Um, so in the year, I think, 2001, um, Dr. Paletti, uh, in a, a study that was sponsored by Kaiser Per Minute, they released what is called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study. So it was looking at adults um, and how many negative uh, traumatic experiences they have as children. Did they live in uh, an environment that had high poverty, crime? Did their parents have addiction issues? Was there violence in the home? Um, did they witness violence? Uh, um, was there a divorce in the family? And the summation of these markers throughout their lives without intervention led to, again, maladaptive coping mechanisms, so drug abuse, promiscuity, uh, uh, overeating, incarceration. And putting two and two together, like what, what's, what's happening here? Like, you know, we're seeing all these adults that are really struggling just to do everyday tasks. Um, and the flip just doesn't switch one day, or more often than not, the flip just doesn't switch one day. And so they looked back at their childhood and found you know, a, a pattern of abuse and neglect, um, exposure to violence. And so they released the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. And so along came Dr. Burke Harris, she was a Stanford trained uh, uh, pediatrician. And so she would be in Palo Alto studying, and then she'd go down to Oakland and do her work. And, you know, just in Palo Alto and Oakland are pretty significant. And she would see these kids just really, really struggling and couldn't figure it out. It wasn't, you know, a physical mallet, you know, it wasn't a, a typical, you know, asthma or they need glasses. It's, it's, there's something more going on. And they were just in a constant fight or flight state because when you're traumatized, it, it triggers the, the part of your brain where it says, you need to leave, you need to fight, or I don't know what to do, and we're just stuck right here. Um, and so she's really dig digging deep into that and recognizing, okay, we've identified adverse childhood experience. It's, it's, and there's there's a, a test we can take and see how many we've had. Um, but what are we going to do to prevent them or to intervene with them and, and recognize that when they happen, we have we have skills and stuff in place to to respond to them appropriately um, and recognizing the way trauma manifests in a child and i have recently gone through a trauma pretty significant trauma myself um and in this bizarre situation where i'm, I'm observing myself go through trauma that i've learned about and recognizing it oh this is what this is like and then this is completely horrible and i couldn't imagine being a three, four, five, ten year old who doesn't have um, the vocabulary or, or the world experience to even recognize what's going on. It's just, this is how I observe life. Uh, and it, it would be just a terrifying reality. Um, and so, the work she's going to do uh, or champion in California is to really come up with preventative ways to uh, avoid, first, avoid ACEs. Uh, and second, how do we react to them so they don't snowball and culminate? And, and you know, we have societies full of you know broken adults as opposed to injured children that we can help you know navigate these realities. Right. And her approach with being from the medical field, you know, sitting here thinking, because it seems like it's a daunting challenge, you know, to be honest, um, especially when you um, are looking at that so much of the uh, of the of the brain, um, you know, synapses forming so quickly so fast and um and you as a parent you know i have two kids if you don't have tools or an understanding and you know childhood development has been taught up until and even right now as when to give them sippy cups when they should be walking how to talk to them but there's been no context of understanding emotional connection and emotional development i mean it's it's emerging but it's still not commonplace it's not you know uh, the normal in terms of uh, of parenting class and things like that you know breastfeeding gets a whole lot of attention and that's yeah. one of the most natural things that we've ever done um, but but when you come into the, the to the emotional development that's just still you know pretty empty and so I'm sitting here to myself going oh my gosh like you know where's the best inroad you know to reaching a parent from day one and um, and you know I'm, I'm thinking like dr. you know Nadine Burke Harris she's a she's a physician right so it's like you start it at the gynecologist in the OBGYN I mean that might be the very first contact because guess what they see a pregnant person they know the baby's coming right <laughs> they're like the first line of you know of information um, but then when you when you also look at like attachment theory and you and, and and John Balby who developed attachment theory he recognized way back then that you couldn't 
you couldn't heal the child without healing the parent. And so it's not just as easy as you know, is just teaching the parent coping skills and how to emotionally connect. Because again, I'm one of them. I have a show called One Broken Mom for a reason. The absence of good models and knowing what I should do doesn't mean the implementation and execution on my side was going to happen because I had a whole bunch of healing I needed to go through. And so this becomes such a a complex and challenging problem, right? It's not just as easy as we hand out a pamphlet at the doctor's appointment of this is what you need to know about emotional development and suddenly a whole generation is healed. It's a, it's a tangled mess, you know? Yeah, and, that's it. So the, and there's another project we have within the foundation called the Constellations Project. And, and it's literally designed to begin this dialogue. So we have uh, educators, we have police officers, uh, medical professionals, brain health professionals, um, uh, somebody from an insurance company as well, and, and talking about how do we diffuse these silos because we're all seeing the same people. Like we're all seeing, and, and within the capacities of our, of our professions, um, but we're seeing the same things being repeated over and over again. So collectively, we're failing. You know, so let's, let's you know, not point fingers, but how do we do this better? Um, and so much of it is, is you know, having uh, shared dialogue. And, you know, a, a common place to come. And you know, you, you reference the OBGYN. You look on the brain health side. We have we have psychiatrists, we have psychologists, we have uh, LCSWs and therapists, and we have neurologists and, and neuroscience. And so, like, there's five or six silos just within this specific field, and they don't always get along. Even you know, they feel like their field is the most important. Um, and changing that perception, where again, we're we're a collective toolbox. You know, and maybe what I'm doing today isn't the best uh, uh, treatment engagement, but I know so-and-so down the street. And let, let's see if we can take care of this child or this family collectively you know, in a way that's, that just serves us all. Um, and, and trying to diffuse that, that uh, the, the pride and, and bias without making people uh, feel dismissed either, you know, that their, their profession is uh, worthy. Um, you know, it, separately from the foundation, I also serve on my local board of education. And so we see brain health stuff every day, you know, and, and it's, it's changing so dramatically. You know, the onset of cell phones and kids using cell phones and growing up in the tablet generation. And, you know, one of the issues we talked about at a recent meeting was um, kids bringing cell phones into school and it instigating their anxiety because their parents constantly texting and they check on them. So this is mm. parenting anxiety literally transferring through 4G to the child and considering, you know, why we exist as a foundation and what the world is like. I completely empathize and have full compassion for that anxiety that parents have, um, but also recognizing um, that you strengthen your child if you allow that that tether to go a little bit, and, and they can kind of navigate school as it's their environment. Um, so it's, it's so many difficult challenges, um, you know. In, in conjunction with we're at the infancy of you know brain health research, I think. We're also not really sure how to best use technology. Um, I think there, there's a correlation between the two. You know, that the the uh, incessant need to, to be um, on the phone or connected with the world outside of where you presently are um, isn't necessarily healthy. I think and that's, that's something we can all work on. Yeah. So how many how many projects are you guys uh, you know got your fingers in right now that you're you're funding? Um, um, so right now, so we, we had a, we're a two-year funding cycle for our research. So we have, I, I referenced three research uh, components. So we have our luminaries, which we award when we just feel compelled to award it. Um, so we, we could award multiple years, it could just be one. Um, and we've had two in our six years. Um, so we really kind of look for the best and brightest. Um, and then we have our neuroscience award, which is $100,000 collectively, $50,000 each year. Um, and that has gone to um, the initial one with the University of Michigan. Um, and then the, the next went to um, Harvard. Uh, and then this most recent one this year went to Michigan State University. Um, and then we also have a public health award, which is $25,000. So it was 15 total, $25,000 each year. Um, and those went to University of Northern Colorado, um, Yale University, and uh, was Wisconsin School of Medicine this year um, were the, the, the six that we've been funding. Um, and the outcomes have been, been pretty impressive. Uh, you know, the, the first research we funded at the University of Michigan with uh, Dr. Hyde and Dr. Burt, 
uh, literally looking at twins, the sporting twins. So one child, um, typical child, typical behavior. The other was antisocial, aggressive behavior. Um, and using fMRI and different stimulus, we're, we're mapping the brain. Where did this agitation come from? So they could really start to understand where the areas of um, the origins of violence come from. Um, and it was a, a brilliant study. And you know, our hope with any study is we just want to get published, you know, in, in a reputable peer-reviewed uh, journal uh, that'll help us build our brand. But it's, it shows that the science is peer-reviewed and valid, and it's not, you know, just this mumbo jumbo and we're patting ourselves in the back. Um, amazingly, and I, I remember this day vividly. Um, the, the study at University of Michigan was awarded three NIH grants for a total of seven point one million dollars. So, wow! Yeah. So you know, it, it, we, we we jokingly refer to ourselves as a neuroscientific hedge fund. Like we just we put money behind them, and it's tough to get a better return than a hundred thousand dollars in and seven point one million out when the real return is is truly understanding the origins of violence. Um, and what's unique about the study with Dr. Hyde and Burt is so much of the neuroscientific, neuroscientific research has been done on adults. Um, and they recognize often those adults are compromised by addiction issues themselves. So when they're doing fMRI scans, you're not really sure if the, the behavior is a function of their genetics and their environment, or is it being manipulated because of the substances they're on or the use of the substances. And it's, you know, it's not a, a clean, um, so to speak, uh, specimen to, to research. So that's why they really want to look at children um, because it is, it's, it's a clean slate and it's where the brain is developing. So we can really better understand where these things come from and the origin of it. Um, and excitingly, it's not simply just lab science for them. They also follow up with these families in the home and really look at um, uh, parenting techniques. Um, and is it different with one child than the other? And they release a paper, you know, looking at that. You know, as a child presents to be a little more difficult, your parenting style changes. Mm -hmm. um, and, and it's something we all have to be cognitive of because when the, when the child um, recognizes that and adjusts, sometimes the parents don't and it still stays pretty intense towards one and not the other. And then that child just starts to say, well, I, it doesn't matter what I do, I'm still gonna get treated you know, less than you know, my sister or brother. Um, so it's, it's, it's a, a, a ever evolving, yeah, organism, a family, you know, in, in parenting, um, and always, you know, trying to be present and, and be engaged with, you know, our behavior, you know, our wants, needs, our emotional states, um, in addition to how our kids are reacting to that. You know? So that's that was really exciting about you know the, the research that you know, Dr. Bert and Hyde did, uh, and continue to do. We continue on obviously with the NIH. Great. And the, the twin studies are always fascinating. That's, you know, it's been done many times over the course of, of you know, research because with the, with the idea that you're able to actually test the nature versus nurture because you, you essentially have as close of a match between two humans, you know, and DNA, if they're identical twins, um, right. that you get to eliminate some of those, you know, factors uh, and then get down to um, seeing, you know, those, those differences, which is, you know, which I think is brilliant. Um, and I, you know, I talked with the neuroscientist um, last year on my last season and you know studying the ch studying children is incredibly invaluable but it's also very hard to get parents to volunteer their kids for studies um, and so when parents are able to do that and willing to do that without of course inflicting a whole nother set of trauma on the child for going through the experience um, it really is a, a pretty compelling place to, to build from and stuff so that's that's pretty awesome you know when you were talking about the twin too you know in my experience as well is um, you know it becomes a snowball effect definitely um, when one child begins to exhibit you know some behavior that's challenging from a parent especially a parent that doesn't know where their own triggers are coming from and that it does it kind of keeps building you know the, the the parental relationship gets strained the child is feeling more and more protective and survival mode kicks in and then the other dynamics and so it is uh, it, it's a huge challenge um, and I can imagine that that just it, it feels like the deficit grows rather than improves you know when when once a, a kid starts to act out 
Um, and it just kind of goes from there. I, I personally, you know, I know it's hard for me given everything that I know and everything I put into practice and the fact that I, you know, I go to therapy every two weeks because it's a, it's an ongoing process, knowing everything that I do and everything, all the work that I do, I'm challenged by that, you know, that, that every day. Um, so, and you said you worked on the, the school board. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've also observed is trauma. And I've, I've spoken with somebody about trauma-informed schools because, you know, when kids go into those environments, those are other people that have constant contact with our children. And yeah. some of them are also unaware or, you know, are not trauma-informed enough. And they, they can kind of add to the ongoing, and I don't want to call it abuse, but maltreatment and just not understanding that the bad kids are likely coming from bad situations at home, you know, and need not to show up to school and be further, you know, ostracized, but schools just don't have all the tools available to them to be able to do that. And that's a big chunk of hours out of the day, you know, have yeah. you ever, have you ever funded anybody or had any groups approach you that are looking at understanding the, the impacts of schools on a child's behavior? Um, so we, we've worked on what we call brain health 101. Mm -hmm. uh, it's really, uh, an introductory course, um, uh, combination of, of trauma-informed care, understanding the origins, literally what, what, what chemicals are firing in the brain and traumatized child. Um, and a lot of the population we've trained within that were, were schools. Um, so it, so much of it is education. And these are, you know, teachers are intuitively engaged and understand the human condition better than most. And when you give them a skill, they'll implement it. Um, and so much of it is just uh, giving them the opportunity to, to question and learn, you know, know exactly what it is. Um, having worked with traumatized kids early on in my career, it's, it's a, a challenge that there's no answer to, you know, but there are better ways for us to create environments that are safe, nurturing, loving towards all children. Um, and one of the projects I worked on early in my career when I worked for a group called Family and Children's Aid um, was bringing in this, this trauma-informed play that was developed by the Life of Good Kids Foundation um, to create an environment, not just for the kids, but for the staff, where the connective mechanism was, was gross motor skill play. Like, it's what kids do, how they communicate. Um, and it was amazing how that transformed these environments. And these are group homes with kids that are new for abuse and neglect. You know, they're the worst stories you could hear. Um, and just empowering them on a, on a field that felt equalizing, you know, like when, when you know, me as you know, a six foot tall, you know, grown adult chasing them around, you know, uh -oh, with parachutes and, you know, fuzzy balls and, and rubber chickens and them tagging me and getting it, it creates that, that visceral human connection that we feel so disconnected to from following trauma. Um, but for kids, they're, they're craving it, particularly from adults, that it's that I can trust you and this is safe. And because so many of them, particularly in those environments, didn't have that. You know, it's, it's we're, we're wired to believe like, okay, that's my mom and dad and they're gonna protect me and love me. And when that falls through, like that's, that's just a, 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 something we're, as a species, we're not prepared to navigate. Mm -hmm. um, we're still looking for that connection. Um, and, and similarly, like with teachers, it's, it's understanding like something tragic um, or, or something persistent, persistence happening in the home of a child in your class, what are the adaptations you can make that school can be their safe place and they can feel connected and they can feel loved and not feel pushed out or overlooked? Um, you know, one of the things we did, so, sorry, I keep talking about the school board, um, when I first joined, um, was we made uh, breakfast free for every child if they wanted it because recognizing we're a biological organism. And if you're not fed, you're not going to learn. And if you're not going to learn, you're going to distract the class. And if you're distracting the class and you're hungry, your body's in a state of panic. You know, it's, it's saying, I'm hungry. You know, what am I going to do? Um, and it was really a, a, a simple solution, um, but also gave kids the opportunity um, to share breakfast with, you know, their friends in a way that wasn't stigmatizing. You know, it wasn't just those kids who going to breakfast. Like, Everybody can go grab a bag of breakfast and have you know food together in the morning, um, and it's those are from a foundation perspective solutions like that that are that are um, simple, easy to replicate, um, but have scientific backing. Like we need food for our brains to work. You know, we need food to not be in stress. 
Um, and then if you can combine food or sharing with another human being, I mean, that's an, an essential part of who we are, you know, as, as animals. Uh, birds like to spend time and eat food together. It's just a connective um, uh, uh, mechanism. And so, you know, just looking at opportunities within our communities to implement these things. And that's really, we, we can vent as much violence with that um, as we can with, you know, some of the, the bigger studies that we're Right, right. Of course. Now, I'm curious, um, you have a lot of experience. You've, you've touched on it um, before the Aviav Foundation. How did you get into this field of children and brain health? So, uh, I went to school as a history major. <laughs> Sounds totally logical. <laughs> <laughs> um, did a lot of work in summer camps. Um, and then when I got done with my undergrad, um, you know, back when, you know, you found jobs in the newspaper, I was trying to do a class by that. <laughs> Or that they did, uh, earlier, family and children did. Um, and at the time, you know, they're, they're a, 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 a small emerging group that had a long history, about a hundred something years. Everybody goes to the like, flows, and they're kind of in one of the valleys, um, but they're opening group homes. Uh, Connecticut was going through a crisis in foster care. Um, the, the foster care system was as um, abusive to the kids, unfortunately, as some of the, the home. Um, so they built a infrastructure of safe homes. So there was an in-between and they could, they could recruit and find more competent uh, foster care for their family. Um, so I was hired as a direct care worker. You know, my first job out of college, um, working with these kids uh, and having worked a lot with kids in after school programs and summer camps, but you know, pretty much typical kids with not too many challenges. Um, first shift I was, I was changed forever. Mm -hmm. Things you hear and you know the experiences that these kids go through, you know, at a, a fifth of my age were just you know bone jarring, and I knew I, I found um, what my purpose was. Uh, and luckily enough, um, navigating that and working in the group homes, and I built a summer camp for them with the donor. Um, I realized after a year or two, I didn't have the the uh, the skills that a therapist does. I, I couldn't do the intimate therapeutic interaction. Like it, was, it, it overwhelmed me. Like I, I was, you know, it, I, I, I felt too moved to um, do something on their behalf as opposed to kind of just navigate and, and be a good listener. Um, but I was lucky enough to be able to kind of develop the development, the engagement, fundraising office through there. So I spent 13 years there. Um, and then I came to Newtown four years ago uh, and ran a, a rec center. And that's where I met Jeremy and Jan and the Abiel Foundation. We shared an after school program. Um, and then when that came to an end, um, it was when Jeremy reached out and, and uh, see, see if I wanted to join the Abiel Foundation. So again, at the Abiel Foundation in March of 2017, so just over two years. Wow. Um, and, you know, it was, it was a, a perfect balance of. Um, my fundraising and operational competencies, and then obviously Jeremy's scientific uh, background and you know, the origin story, and, and we've had a lot of success and significant growth over the last few years. Cool. Now, um, so I, I'm a self-proclaimed rebel. I, I get that part of it, and you know, I started to, <laughs> and I started to do this, um, you know, uh, over over a year ago now, um, with the intention of you know of changing lives, saving you know lives, and and at times I'm a, you know it's a numbers game to me, and so you know I've spent a great deal of time. I'm um, having had um, uh, some some experience with this, but I do touch on the fact that you know 50,000 roughly 50,000 people a year die a violent death but it's at their own hands and when you compare that to um, homicide which is maybe 20,000 people a year um, you know like I said when I think of this as a numbers game it seems like if we're talking about violence and death the violence that people perpetrate against themselves you know would save twice as many lives by understanding the origin of that um, now, so then my question is, is has Avial, the Avial Foundation, um, been looking at supporting projects in that aspect of brain health, especially now um, for people that um, may or may not remember, you know, your group has been touched. I mean, we've mentioned Jeremy several times in this interview, but Jeremy died by suicide earlier this year. And so did, did, did that change any of the, the thinking or outlook or um, direction for Avial, uh, the Avial Foundation around 
the violence that people do against themselves? So violence itself has always been part of our mission. Um, that brainstorm experience we referenced earlier, uh, our second speaker was a guy, Kevin Hines, who su survived the suicide attempt up the Golden Gate Bridge. Um, incredibly compelling, he just re released a documentary uh, on broken. Um, we haven't funded uh, any suicide prevention research yet, uh, and I haven't seen all the applications. Um, I'm not sure if any have come across, um, but we, we, are, we are wide open. Uh, in terms of what we'll fund, and obviously, the, the, how close that is now with us. Uh, you know, one of, one of the challenging things for everybody is Jeremy had all the tools and knew all the tools. Um, you know, but, but the, the grief and loss uh, just overwhelmed him. Um, you know, and, and it's, it's, it's still, it will forever be difficult to really understand. Um, but I feel personally, uh, it, it, we're not going to carry on the stigma that's been associated with suicide. Um, it is uh, a manifestation of um, uh, an environmental trigger combined with, you know, ge genetic vulnerabilities. You know, are, are you depressed? And if you're depressed, um, what are those things that can push you over the line? You know, the loss of your child in a, in a murder that's been, you know, throughout, you know, uh, throughout the world, you know, since the day happened. Is it, you know, the loss of a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend? Um, we're seeing epidemic rises in suicide across all demographics. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, tragically, um, you know, Jeremy fits right in the middle of the largest demographic, and that's middle-aged men, you know, they're 40 to 65. Um, and, and one of the frustrations we've had, uh, and have always had, um, is, you know, I referenced it earlier, some of the political roadblocks through research and violence. You know? 6% of all suicides um, are attempted with a firearm, but 49% of all completed suicides are done by firearm. So yep. a small portion of it, um, it despite this being a, a national epidemic, uh, we can't pursue that through the Center for Disease Control and the NIH. And so it's eased a little bit because of political robot, roadblocks associated with gun ownership. Um, which is just, it just, I don't get it, you know, like I grew up in a, in a, a police family, um, guns were something that were just part of our lives, it was a tool that my father, brother, grandfather, uncle, aunt, everybody carried, um, we respected it, we trusted it, um, but when it's that accessible and you look at, you know, officer suicide, and you look at veteran suicide, it, it's even higher within them. Um, it, it's just a matter of putting the research and the science behind it. You know, and that's, that's personally what's frustrating as well. Um, so we would love to, you know, get more engaged with that. Um, and that's something our board's assessing as well. You know, are we going to expand to more um, specific RFPs? Because we, we've really just been wide open um, because there is so much to fund. Um, but it is, it's, it's challenging. You know, and we've talked about brain health challenges. We've, we've talked about being parents as well. Um, and I referenced my own trauma, and my trauma is from these gyms. And we were good friends, great friends, you know, all of brothers. Um, and, and, you know, we, we built and had a lot of special successes here. You know, it just moved so rapidly in, in a way that is just mind boggling um, through me and through his file. You know, within a week, you know, I, I found an amazing therapist. I've been using an antidepressant myself as well, just to keep those ebbs and flows out. Um, and you talk about being mindful around your kids, like we have, you know, eight and five year old who thought of Jeremy as an uncle, you know, and how do we uh, expose them to this loss that we're seeing clearly, you know, on me and my wife. Um, and a lot of it is just, it's amazing when you're, when you're completely vulnerable, you know, how easy it is to come to decisions and it'll just be as honest as possible with them, which, which would make sense in their developmental state, you know, and, um, and that's been a weight off our shoulders, so to speak, you know, and, and making sure that dialogue stays open. And so that's just us telling them this happened and we're not going to talk about it. It's, it's a daily, weekly dialogue. Um, you know, so it's, it's an important part of just us collectively. Um, you know, even my own identity. Like I've been in social services my whole life. I grew up uh, the son of a first responder and a, and a preschool teacher. Like I, I, I'm wired to serve and probably have a big genetic component to it. Um, 
and, and I've always struggled to accept help because I just view myself as a professional helper. Um, first week in, in you know my session with the therapist was like, you, you got to let that go. Okay, you know it was never true. It's something you projected on yourself, but like you're not getting through this without you know opening it up. Um, and so uh, I've been a huge proponent of men pursuing brain health. Uh, you know, you know for the 15, 16 years that I've been in the field. Uh, now I'm um, as, as vocal as can be. You know, anybody who asks, um, I tell them exactly what I'm doing in terms of my therapy. I don't hide from it. Uh, you know, even text messaging. Right? You say, how are you doing? Sometimes, yeah. All things considered, not too bad. Sometimes it's, you know, a couple hundred words of where I'm exactly at. You know, and get low back. But it's, it's, we really have to change our paradigm of how we're the protective factors to one another. You know, that's going to be one of the, uh, Perpetual question for me uh, in my grief is where did I fall short? Can I say it? And, you know, is that something um, that uh, how you know how do I use that as, as a way to to strengthen society and others? You know, in terms of you know my loss, but to prevent you know more things as well. And make it, right. Right. You know, yeah. Um, and I'm sorry for your loss. Um, I think I might have said that to Susie too, yeah. but um, I, I am very sorry about it. And um, and it was another one of those uh, pieces of news. You know, I'm on the opposite side of the country from you, and I and I felt um, complete astonishment. You know, of the this doesn't seem even imaginable. Um, you know, a person whose whose life and field um, was about this. To, and, and that's what just makes it, you know, my statement that I had shared with Susie and which I had shared with other people was that's how important brain health and understanding it and how, how little we really do know about it and respecting the, you know, and, and being driven to search for these answers because you can on the surface and on paper know a whole lot about it and still not know enough, you know, and that it's, it's, it's literally life-saving. It's, you know, to be able to, to, to dig in and, and try to figure this out because it, because, you know, if a, if a man like Jeremy, you know, um, finds himself in this situation, knowing everything that he knew and experienced and being surrounded by, you know, uh, you know, daily by folks like you that are also, you know, neck deep in, in the world, um, still, you know, um, I, like I said, just, I was like, it, it's dumbfounding, you know, um, and again, I'm, I'm sorry for your loss with that. So, um, so I'd like to ask, like, who can apply for grants with Aviel? I mean, who are you looking for? You, you mentioned RFPs and you guys are wide open. And so yeah. um, what kind of people should apply? Yeah, you can go to our website uh, on the research. We're actually doing a rebuild, so it'll probably switch over uh, at some point this summer. But it'll be under the research. We usually open up the RFP um, early fall, and then we award um, January or so, January, February. Uh, depending on how many applications come in in, in the process. Um, so it's, it's, you know, anybody who has um, obviously the, the uh, academic and research capacity um, to look at neuroscience, uh, either in violence prevention or compassion building, and on the same side with the public health. Um, you know, some of the, the studies we funded in the public health, uh, the University of Northern Colorado is looking at uh, college students and the impact of um, ACEs, the adverse childhood experiences on the, the, the college experience. And what do we need to do to make that more successful to them? Because we recognize education is one of the biggest keys to uh, preventing the, the cycle of violence and the cycle of, of generational poverty. Um, so what adapt adaptations can we make to the college experience to make sure those vulnerable kids can get through, you know, and, more successful way. Um, so it's, it's really it, it, the public health side is, is I'm more familiar with it than the neuroscientist side. You know, it's, 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 it's where I've sat. Um, so those are, are really incredible studies. And the other one I started with funding is at Yale. Um, and it's actually a, a, a response team that's within the ER. Um, and if somebody comes in due to gang violence or some kind of other violence, the team engages the peers who came in with the victim to help them separate from the moment, to not go out and seek retribution and make one violent act turn into grief or you know a, a summer of violence. Um, and it's really looking at you know where are the origin points of violence is I really where can we you know intervene you know prevent and cure. Um, and it's it's you know anybody who's got 
an idea, you know, and, and the capacity to really study it, we'd love to hear from you. Um, and, and that's, you know, really the exciting part of the work we do. You know, and my primary role is, is to raise money. Um, and, and I think that's one of the neatest parts of the foundation is we are really grassroots driven. You know, this is, we raise our money through, we had 60 people run the, the Ragnar in Cape Cod uh, three weeks ago, you know, it's a 200 mile relay, 12 people on a team, um, collectively, they raised fifty thousand dollars. So that means one of our research studies gets raised because you know people from throughout the country decided to put on our T-shirt and do this crazy relay race, um, but also build our community and, and, and you know and, and focus on their own brain health. Um, and so so many of our donations come through, uh, you know, fifty, hundred dollars, and, and this, you know, they build up to where we can literally change the trajectory of humanity. You know, in the way we understand our species, um, and that in itself is uh, one of the truest forms of compassion. You know, I've ever seen. And we all feel uh, so broken by, you know, Sandy Hook and uh, Virginia Tech and Parkland and Aurora. I mean, all these have names, but every minute of every day, people's lives are being changed by violence. And we want to be a voice for all of them, uh, and you know, we really want to come up with solutions. Um, because one of the things that gets us to is whenever another mass shooting happens, and people say, oh, nothing has happened, nothing has changed. A lot has changed, but there's a lot to be fixed as well. You know, we, we, we know more than we ever have, um, but it, it's, it's a, a, a societal norm that's unacceptable, um, and unfortunately, kind of just feeds off of it. Yep. Yep. So um, for everybody that's listening, I'll have a link on the podcast notes to, um, to the, the organization, but also to where um, you guys are accepting donations online and to get more information about how to contribute to the AVL um, Foundation and to be able to support the work that you guys are doing. Um, with understanding um, these, uh, the, the organ, the brain organ and its links to violent behavior and compassionate behavior. Um, well, Nick, it's been a pleasure. This has been a, a great conversation. I appreciate hearing everything about you and your personal experiences, as well as the, you know, some of the emerging information that's coming out that you guys have been behind and supporting. And, um, and like I said, being a rebel, I love disruptors. So I love people that are taking a completely different look at it and just saying, you know, there's, there are norms out there and there are political ramifications, but we don't care. We're just going to jump that hurdle and, <laughs> and tackle it anyway. So um, scrappy groups of people, you know, that's how big changes happen. And um, you guys are that, um, you know, coming out of something as tragic and as terrible as Sandy Hook. Um, I also have tremendous respect for people when they are able to say, we can let this hurt us and we can let this ruin us or we can let this define us in a more powerful way in a positive way and to be able to um you know magnify the impact so that you know the losses you know were for nothing you know um and don't have meaning and purpose moving forward so appreciate everybody that's involved with your organization including you um for for doing that um so so thank you we're honored to have you on our side and uh just stay in touch keep you up to date on, on awesome i love it Thank you.